we start our panel discussion on renovation and environment, how uh, to big projects influence and citizens. So we'll start with Sergei Lovkin uh, in charge of the construction policy of Moscow. We also have Fine Zhang in charge uh, CEO of the Project Institute of Shanghai, Daniel Almeyer. Uh, the founder of Project Bureau Raum Position, Tatiana Palidia, Executive Director of the Institute Economy of the City, and also Yaroslav Kuzminov, a Deputy of Moscow State City Duma, uh, Rector of uh, High State of Economy, Alexander Lamakin. Uh, uh, and Shap Shaposhnikov of uh, Deputy. Uh, president of the Moscow City Duma, Anatoly Konstantinov, uh, Foundation for Renovation, uh, Leonid Kievsky, uh, Development of the City, Nadezhda Kosira, President of the Foundation Institute of the City Economy, and also Alexander Kozlov, member of the uh, Social Chair of the city of Moscow in charge of uh, renovation and control on renovation. So I've discussed some issues before the start of the session. Everyone will try to be specific and try to be Everyone will also try to touch upon this issue from different angles and Sergei in his presentation, will touch upon uh, most issues. And for that, he will have uh, a bit more time than the other speakers. Uh, 1.2 years ago, the word renovation was first voiced in Moscow after Mayor Sabanian met President Putin, and President Putin supported this project. It became clear that more than one million of Moscovites uh, live uh, in very old flats, uh, which couldn't be improved, or partially. They faced problems and challenges uh, during capital improvement. Um, and we had a lot of letters from people saying that we spent huge amounts of money for improvement, uh, but uh, the flats uh, are still impossible to live in. So we started questioning our Moscovites, uh, being the president of the social board and the social chair, I can say that a lot of people voted for renovation, though the issue has always been very sensitive and difficult. So I will moderate our session of today. And most important thing is that we have a new stage of the project called renovation. Now, this is not only uh, the project which helps people to move from old flats to some new ones. It is not only that. The mere concept changes. Uh, the concept of the environment. So the places where they meet, uh, where they move, are no longer just flats, just rural areas for them. That will be a new place for them to live. And I'm proud for this project. I'm proud for our experts who launch it, and I think they're success, success. So I would like to give the floor to Sergei Lovkin for his presentation. Good afternoon, my dear friends. A lot has been spoken about renovation starting uh, 2017. Still, the problem is that we know a lot, and uh, the citizens, uh, the Moscow citizens, uh, know too little. Only those who have joined the program. So I would like to 
uh, touch upon the stages um, of the project, uh, how it started, how it went on, and how we see it to develop. And I would like to share all this here in the Moscow Urban Forum. Clear enough. Um, our city, with one of the most rapidly developing metropolitan cities in the world, and we have both pros and cons, uh, advantages and challenges uh, all these cities face, and all this has been voiced uh, during the plenary session by the mayor and during the panel sessions too. So, uh, 2, 250 million uh, is uh, the uh, is the money for uh, the for the fund uh, of housing in Moscow. So we started this project uh, with five-story houses of the Khrushchev period, uh, the end of 1960, beginning of 1970s. Old-fashioned houses having not so many differences from what we are having now, what we're dealing with now. And I think that uh, in some 10 years there will be no more shabby houses like that. But other people started to complain that they also wanted to be part of the project, saying that uh, their blocks of flats uh, belong to some different serial number, but uh, were not less shabby than those uh, five-story blocks. So we started analyzing different blocks of flats. I remember one block we entered. Uh, it was so tiny, uh, so the uh, heating system was part of the panel. If we wanted to repair it, then we had to take away the well, big part of the wall. So very tiny bathrooms, so tiny rooms you can put there, nothing actually. So all that. Uh, actually gave rise to the question, why should we spend so much money on repairment uh, if the people will have uh, the same conditions just a bit later? Uh, uh, then why not spending money for something new with new environment and of new quality? So we, we had a lot of discussions with experts by the government and in the government, and Mayor Sabanyan took a decision to make forward. He decided that that would be a program covering up to one-third of Moscovites, because uh, uh, it covers not only people who uh, moved to new flats, but uh, there were other people who lived in the neighborhood. They became part of the project. So Mayor Sabanyan voiced that program uh, on the highest possible level, and he was criticized. Uh, people started asking why uh, the decision was taken so rapidly. It was not true because we uh, used questioning, we used the platform active citizen, uh, we used different feedbacks, and uh, the most important instrument we used was the uh, house code, the new law. After the 1st of July, people who voted against it couldn't enroll in it. So today, uh, 5,171 house has already become part of this program. The program was assessed 
uh, by international experts as well. Uh, our colleagues uh, from the Institute of the City Economy helped us and they will share their expert opinion today. We also studied uh, the experience of different mega cities, and this was the problem all the mega cities once faced, uh, and uh, they started to solve it. Some of them used some external experts, external funding, but the basic way was the same. Uh, all the mega cities moved forward because today we need to develop uh, the structure and the infrastructure which should be human centered, where the human is in the center and everything is for the human. Mayor of Moscow took several uncomparable decisions to help people moving to new flats to feel comfortable. They didn't have to pay uh, for uh, capital improvement, which is uh, part of the regular payment. Otherwise, number two, we tried to support and the people who moved, and for that, unprecedented methods of support were taken. Some people uh, with limits or, or with uh, too little income, all those people had help offered by the state. Well, good idea is a good idea, but uh, any good idea should be regulated and should be uh, proved by life. So for people who take part in changing the flats, uh, some instruments were used, and that was a special code, special standards, where uh, all characters were specified. What is comfort class housing? Um, oh, so what is necessary for that? What are the criteria for each type of living? So after having worked out the basic standards, we worked out smart standards we called 2.0. So you can uh, go uh, to the first floor and you can see all those standards specified. Besides, uh, well, it's clear that a flat is one part requiring the standard. But the environment around the block, uh, the area, is not less important. So the key issues there are as follows. So we wanted the territory of the urban block or this many district to be private. We wanted to avoid some exterior impacts from the outside, which is noise, which is pollution, parking. Uh, those districts should be special for people who live there, comfortable uh, with parks, green, so that people could walk around with their children. And all that was part of our plan. Uh, so Mayor Sabanyan said, we'll do it like this, no matter how costly it is. We have standards for trees. We have standards for distance. So the trees should be not less higher, high than five meters. So can you imagine that? Standards for trees. And this is very important because uh, the word tree is tricky, uh, can be used for some mini trees, for example, and this is not uh, greening. So this is what we're trying to do now. So we have 
the stages. They are clear for experts and they are clear for people. People ask, when, when will I move? But there are special uh, steps and they are specified and they are transparent. We all say the truth. Uh, because we have more than 1,000 applications a week. And uh, this is actually the dating. See, if we start uh, at, the at the beginning of 2017, uh, then uh, you can see the next step and you can see the third step, etc. Uh, and uh, a person can can see, wow, I will move in the year 2022. And this is life in accordance with rules. Because we, we've started uh, the project in a very fast way, but we want it to develop sustainably. Because sometimes, you know, we can start too quickly and have a lot of uh, negative things uh, during the developmental session. I would like to thank my colleagues and Natalia and Liana. Uh, she is responsible for that. Yeah, well, she has a lot of experts she works with. People criticize her, but they uh, and she, they go on. We have a lot of problems, we have a lot of challenges, and they're all familiar. Procedures, barriers, hindrances. We have uh, a special problem office launched for that. Because we need to cut all the procedures, making them less bureaucratic, and we are a success. Last year, we managed to cut the whole procedure to one year. We spoke and had a lot of discussions with the federal government. We, we've been trying to, uh, well, to have compromise. But this compromise has nothing to do with the construction, as some people would probably think. No. The problem was not the construction standards, but the procedures, bureaucratic procedures, before and after construction. Today, we have the Russian register list. Uh, and there, uh, they managed to register the new project within three days. And it's really efficient. This helps us uh, to uh, help uh, the, help the people to give them the documents on their flats three days after the uh, block has been constructed. So your support is important, and uh, supported by uh, Mayor Sabianian, we. Uh, just decided to ask you, uh, because you are the people who know better than all of us what should be improved. So we have a special office, and we try to react. Alexander is here, and he's responsible for that. You remember, uh, some week ago, uh, well, there was a lady complaining that she had to wait for two days for a feedback, you know. Two days seems long for them. There are a lot of issues which are clear for us, but not so clear for uh, Moscow citizens. So I'd like to thank you. It's really important. Your support is important. There is a foundation which has been created specially for that. Anatoly Konstantinov is a famous person in Moscow. I think he is the best manager for this foundation. We work in contact, in collaboration, and this is good. 
And what does Mayor Sabanian says? And this is. Uh, I want to highlight quite sincerely, not because I'm part of his team. No, really, Mayor Sabanian uh, thinks that renovation is one of the most crucial projects for him. He started this project not for somebody, but for people who live and who want to live better. And he tries to go into detail. Uh, he wants to know everything, who does what, and if a problem arises, why and what uh, to do with it. So <clears throat> Myself, my team, and many of my colleagues who are part of the program, who are directly involved, I can tell you personally, I have uh, a lot of experience, different experience in uh, construction industry, in civil engineering, in investment, in commercial affairs. For me, this is uh, the main goal for me, for my professional life. It's interesting for me. It is very important for the city as such. And honestly, I would like to sincerely want to help Muscovites. I'm a Muscovite uh, myself for the latest 40 years. But I would like to change this city, to change the environment, to make uh, Moscow more beautiful comfortable. People need uh, j jobs close. We need uh, um, Soviet bakeries when you can go down and smell the freshly baked to uh, uh, bread at Cheremorsky confectionery to have uh, a beer at the north, uh, the confectionery brand. We would like to create uh, that type of environment. Today we are moving first uh, residence. Uh, the program started in February. So experts could probably advise. In my opinion, we kept our promises and basically people are happy. It's uh, impossible to avoid them. So if the first house is at Fedna Street, people would go, come round, just about variation. But when we started to uh, move people in uh, the west and in the northeast, so people uh, gave their okay like in, in two weeks. So but um, buildings are the same but uh, the trust, the confidence, uh, because some people were trying to make money before the program began and uh, during the program and right after the program. I think that we are turning the mindset and the goal for us all, the goal of our today's session is to build this trust and enhance it. We only want uh, the good for the people. We would like to unveil the program as quickly as possible. But my personal opinion is that I don't want a quick start. I would like to do a high quality job. So for the start to live to a high quality uh, uh, built as a unique philosophy, as a process for everyone who are involved. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei Ivanovich. And I would like to clarify two points. Recently, we use the term like uh, wave uh, relocation. Uh, so for the audience to understand, okay, like you have a block, a neighborhood, where you have 30 buildings which uh, were listed on the program, but you have just one starting point. And uh, according to the law, and following the request of Mayor Sabianin, we want uh, the buildings to stay in the same neighborhood. So at the start, uh, the building was built for some other purposes. But uh, be shaping the wave. So, what do we want to achieve? So, buildings should be located as close to the possible to the building under construction. 
Uh, it's very important what's under the ground uh, utilities because before this system uh, for heating and uh, water supply so it was uh, like looking as a deadlock uh, also the availability of different uh, communications uh, trunk lines which are quite expensive so we have a house of 15,000 square meters, a new house. We need to redesign it to for the uh, apartments uh, to correspond in terms of money to those uh, um, being demolished. And we would like uh, uh, variation if we have uh, 20 uh, two-room apartments. Well, he said, I only want uh, uh, the third uh, to live on the f uh, third floor. So 20% for that uh, variety, variations. And we would also love some people to have uh, the opportunity to buy uh, some extra area. So we started with the three houses. We relocated people from three houses and we planned building another building on that place and so this is what we plan to do in stages thank you so about your residences uh, where will you pull put people as part of the renovation program well i would like to comment on one tiny detail which we started to focus from the very beginning from different points we tried to to evaluate what is available in the house. Because we began with the Department of uh, City Economy, and later on we requested uh, complete files on financial accounts to live who lives there, if they are owners or if they are tenants. So we made a full uh, analysis. We know who are the owners uh, who live at the first, uh, at the ground floors uh, of buildings being demolished. Because uh, legally you need to recompensate them, reimburse them. And thirdly, uh, with the residences you have the most uh, tricky situations where in late Soviet years there were some fantastic things like factory residences, residences belonging to some ministries. Then in the 90s, uh, people uh, could get whatever type of documents. And this is the most challenging situation for us. At the moment, residences uh, that we analyze, so they are not close to the starting houses. For instance, I'm asking the question, so why don't you move our uh, residence to the 5th Parkway Street? But it's so far away. Also, it's not possible to quickly develop the neighborhood based on the residences. And you also need to realize what's the legal status in case uh, a if it's a one-room building, so with the financial accounts, you need to shape a one-room apartment as well. I would like Yaroslav Kuzminov uh, to continue our talk about uh, renovation, but if possible, how it influences the city's economy, this project, renovation. Renovation is not something invented uh, in our country. Many, many large cities in the world uh, went through renovation. And I can really tell you that renovation uh, shaped today's face of Paris. That's the most uh, um, famous uh, case. To a uh, less extent, it influenced uh, uh, okay, like Docklands in London and uh, the specific feature of Moscow's renovation is that, first of all, so the environment uh, 
is being replaced uh, the environment of uh, residential areas where people are, are well rooted and where not uh, the most uh, not the richest people live there because uh, the richest uh, have already left uh, these neighborhoods so uh, this social aspect of the renovation so in my opinion it is the first and the most uh, important in the phenomenon of uh, Moscow renovation. We will witness for several dozens of years, and it will be one of the determining processes for the city development. And, um, As a result, we will have uh, an absolutely different quality of life. Like uh, we in our residential buildings, we don't have uh, backyards, you don't have streets where you can walk, you can only uh, move around. And uh, the useful density is very low. So from the first stories, so we actually need to move to an environment where a street is intensively used, where first floors are used. So an uh, environment of a downtown. It happened so that Moscow grew fantastically uh, in Soviet times in uh, Khrushchev, under the rule of Khrushchev and Brezhnev. It was built uh, according to a model uh, where which Khrushchev loved being to Finland between the Finnish birch trees, but when it was scaled up uh, to it couldn't be a good example on how the city should develop. I believe that uh, we will have, we will be really surprised after five or seven years are over, like as we are surprised as what happened to the downtown of Moscow. The pedestrian downtown, we uh, got used to it, and it uh, really, really improved the attractiveness of city for tourists. And we know that now people still uh, go to the downtown and gather there, and this is a certain sort of pressure on the downtown, but because uh, it's nice now. So this center where you walk uh, around the streets and you feel interested, where you have a lot of uh, attraction points. So actually, this is another belt uh, of five to seven kilometers from the downtown. So you have some larger um, incrustations. Sometimes uh, it's close to the MCAD, but mainly the medium, the medium circle around the downtown. So the downtown, uh, the center of attractive uh, urban life will grow. Not a place uh, to have rest, but the place where you feel like going out. It will increase by many times in 20 years. Uh, so the effect, in my opinion, uh, will be, uh, in terms of quality of life, it will be huge. Moscowites would often say St. Petersburg is a fantastic town because it has a big uh, downtown compared to Moscow. So we will have a downtown three or four times uh, larger in terms of area than in St. Petersburg. Uh, to me, it's really, really interesting. Uh, one more thing I would like to tell you about the economic and civil engineering consequences. So I think uh, there is a sort of social result. Renovation program was born from the idea that Moscowites understood that compared to every tenth resident that um, challenging decision made uh, so we are the only region 
in Russia, which uh, uh, manages to um, get the money for the overhauling. So, but in many Russian cities, uh, you lack the budget. In Moscow, actually, residents were convinced to move to 15 or 17 rubles per square meters. But it's uh, real money. So from 75 uh, meters, you get uh, uh, 1,500. And people wanted something for their money. And renovation, I remember some fantastic explanations related to developers' interests. But in my opinion, the developers were the first people to suffer from this renovation program. And those who, in my opinion, uh, those who waste uh, their positions in the media, no. So it was based on an attempt to honestly answer and continue the program with overhauls where it was it used to be impossible to do the overhaul. To increase uh, apartment area by extra five or seven meters. And then we had to come up with some proposals based on the principle on how to do it. So colleagues, from uh, the city hall and from the social chamber know it. So the e honest economic feasibility, honest calculation, the city uh, should not uh, give the promise uh, which it would be impossible to uh, meet. So because people were saying, so there were social standards under Lushkov. Yeah, but let's calculate the scale. So no budget of city would be enough for that. So. Uh, that's why we came up with the feasibility study. Then, justice in the principle of how you distribute to uh, apartments. And third, transparency of the relocation process. So the f number one, number two, and number three are rare uh, obstacles. Uh, uh, are not uncommon, but it was completed, it was achieved. So we started social and political processes in our city. And I re recall the wave of discussions. So at first, there was a great deal of uh, misunderstanding. The misunderstanding was absolutely real. Then there was the attempt to politically uh, rock the boot to mobilize people who had uh, uh, nothing to do with the program itself, but, well, we all have uh, compassion, well, I would say love for our city. And in just uh, half a year, and for such processes, uh, it's a long period of time, and uh, so opinions changed, opinions of the residents towards the renovation process. So, and people had uh, strong uh, concerns, so they are still in the green area, in the positive area. So why? Uh, in my opinion, first of all, uh, we succeeded because Moscow mastered new instruments of dialogue with residents, reconciliation and uh, listening to opinion. Should we have stayed in the archaic tools zone? in civil engineers, so, so actually we could organize a meeting and take whatever decision, but try to gather people. And as a deputy, also we have Mr. Shapashnikov here, another deputy. People don't trust in uh, the, the outcomes of these meetings. Only 10 houses left the renovation program out of a huge number, I think 5,000 buildings. Imagine only 10 houses left the program uh, using that uh, the right for the residents' meeting. So, but there was a lot of indignation. What? Uh, what about our rights? Okay, exercise your rights. So, uh, people. Uh, 
mastered the process of digital democracy. And in a city size, uh, size of Moscow, no other uh, democracy is possible. Uh, but only when it's based on internet. So because we uh, create a very different communities. So when a person lives in one neighborhood and the school is in another neighborhood, the theater, the club are indifferent. So where is his place? What is he responsible for? So digital democracy, as we tried, it allows just to really shape uh, communities of interested people and others can uh, can contest it if uh, it's detrimental to their interests. So I think that the conclusion uh, is quite optimistic, though I, by nature, is a pessimist person. So for me, a renovation program is a good example for fruitful collaboration between the government and people. And uh, from the point of view of the project development, it looks also very positively too. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to Sergei Choban. My question is as follows, Sergei. You've participated in different projects, major projects uh, in this country and in other countries. So how do you assess uh, renovation here in Moscow? Or in other words, how uh, can we apply um, German experience to what we're doing now in uh, Moscow? Thank you very much, Konstantin. Really? I was happy to see and participate, and I'm still participating, in a lot of projects and processes in Berlin. You know that during the, world, the Second World War, Berlin was destroyed and there were ruins. In 1950s, 1960s, uh, a lot of Khrushchev-like uh, blocks of flats were constructed in Berlin. After uh, Germany has been united, at first they tried to use uh, this word renovation directly. So there were, uh, well, those uh, shabby blocks of flats, and they, they wanted to uh, just to, to ruin them, to destroy them, and to build new ones. But that was too expensive. And it was not so fast. So the pro, the, this process ended and Sergei has specified it uh, with just improvement. So they changed some uh, flats inside, but they didn't destroy uh, the blocks. And there is one more thing. You know, I come from St. Petersburg. It's my favorite city where I was born, and I lived there for 30 years. And uh, you know, there is a very big center, a city center in St. Petersburg. And uh, this kind of detachment from center uh, constructs a kind of hierarchy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the facades of the blocks uh, were kind of uh, different. So uh, the target of Moscow government to change the mere face of Moscow, uh, making it uh, new and up-to-date center is great. The projects and programs uh, I'm involved in try to consider this target uh, using different technologies. Uh, so please look at uh, these two blocks. 
uh, the war panel blocks in which they changed the substance. There are new new homes, but they are constructed of some modernized materials. So this is most important, the quality. So the this uh, these new blocks of flats uh, well should be should have long life. Uh, and this is what we have now, and they have now in Berlin. You can see the environment, you can see the house, and you can see the trees, and Mayor Sabianian has said it. So this is how we do uh, when we uh, change some uh, central areas. So we try to keep the storage the same. When we construct new areas, again, we try to have and to find the hom harmony between the top stores and the ground floors so that everything is in harmony, creating dialogue between, well, the house, the block, and the city. So Berlin is great, but Moscow is uh, goes even further. Today, we are located in uh, the park of Zaredia, which is now one of the best places, not only in Moscow, but in the world. And so we need this kind of environments of the same quality, which should become the basis of these new areas. You may ask me, what? Does this area have to do with renovation? You know, this area started uh, as a well, factory area, and now we have a new area. If you look behind, you will see some blocks of flats of 1960s, 1970s. Some of them are destroyed, and you have uh, new f uh, blocks there. So we have new environment, which is social and private at the same time. Uh, well, the, this river bank um, uh, didn't exist. This area was dreadful and risky. I mean, directly risky because, uh, uh, well, the city doesn't couldn't take the responsibility for what the pedestrians do. So the payments were very small, uh, though it is Berlin. Look what we can see there 15 uh, years later is great environment and it is a life environment which is used by the, the citizens and this is an important part of any renovation program S uh, i don't think we should uh, construct uh, skyscrapers everywhere i think that seven stored buildings are very good but there can be some higher buildings, but they should look special because uh, we create the city of today, which needs to have contrast, some special contrast with their own role. But this should be a detail, uh, not uh, all the blocks of flats should be so high, not more than 20% of them. Uh, and let us not forget that cities have history. And it's most important to preserve the buildings. Well, different cities uh, have different amount of this kind of old buildings. They are the face of cities and towns. Uh, I know that even in places when uh, and where we work, uh, 
the new buildings and the ancient buildings should be in harmony. Look at this picture. You will not recognize what is old and what is new. And this is most important. This is penetration, mutual penetration of uh, the old and all the new. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much for your pictures and for your presentation. Uh, how it was re really interesting how renovation is done in uh, other cities. Now I would like uh, to give the floor to Mr. Fang Chan, uh, CEO of the Project Institute of the City Planning of uh, Shanghai. You know that the city has undergone a great transformation. So I would like to listen to some features of uh, Moscow and Shanghai. Maybe you could explain if there is anything similar between Moscow and Shanghai. Maybe you could share any potential you can see for creating comfortable environment here in Moscow. It's my first time here in Moscow. And I would like to thank uh, all of you for your high assessment and for your uh, invitation us here. In the morning, uh, today we've heard the presentation by Mayor Sabianyan. It's important, it's crucial that the city is competitive. For that, we need to change the city environment tremendously. So we need to create, uh, draft new uh, infrastructure here in Moscow. There is one more reason why I'm here in Moscow, in Shanghai. The population is really big. Historically, uh, well, there are different cultures which uh, are not always friendly to each other. What we need is the approval by 90% of the population only. Uh, in this case, uh, renovation will be approved. People are different. Opinions are different. For th and for 30 years, well, uh, we've been dealing with improvement and renovation uh, of the city of Shanghai. Uh, today, most people think that our work is successful and has been successful. And uh, it is great. Probably it is because we started also uh, in a very fast way. And historically, we did it uh, the way Russia does. And there is one more thing. And I've heard it today that your project of renovation has been worked out in a very detailed way. But there is one more issue which is really significant. During the plenary in the morning, uh, Mayor Sabianyan said he is a great man. He can attract people. He can solve issues and uh, barriers and get through them. Uh, only this kind of people can develop the city. So this is uh, the project which has a great history in Shanghai. There is one message uh, for Moscow. I would like to share my experience with you. So first and foremost, you will have to uh, get rid of uh, 50,000 of blocks of flats and houses. And for many people, they were historic. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, this is not uh, just ancient history, but uh, the Soviet period is also important for China. So for us, some um, blocks of flat and houses of that period are our legacy. And we have uh, to get rid of this kind of blocks. And the same thing concerns Moscow. We can uh, construct a brand new Moscow, but should we do it? Uh, or should we preserve the face of Moscow? In Shanghai, we say that the way from your home to some social places should not be longer than 15 minutes. It's difficult to find 5,000 places in the city where we can fulfill and meet these standards. That is why we need to, to have a survey for that, assessing the status quo. So how should we create uh, and use uh, what we have? Uh, uh, speaking about Moscow, how should the face of Moscow should be, uh, uh, be preserved? Uh, how to do so that uh, uh, what that the new things we create do not destroy uh, the face, the traditions of Moscow, which exist? There is one more important point. We need to have rapid results and long-term perspective on all this we need to combine. Developers are people who develop the territories, and they want immediate results. And it is not always that they have will and power for that. It is not always that they have the vision how this very territory will develop further. So we need to combine the interests of developers, which are recent and long-term uh, term, uh, interests of the citizens and redevelopers. There is a good instrument for that. Uh, for example, any developer should not only sell flats, but think about long-term perspective, how uh, well the developer will uh, rent that area and uh, get profit there, not just immediate, but for a longer perspective. There is one more thing. The prices in Moscow are tremendously high. And in Shanghai, it is also like this. Very little people can afford buying a flat of their own. And this is uh, how Shanghai and Moscow are similar. So we need to develop the booking market for flats here and in Shanghai too. I've heard that uh, most people would prefer to live where they used to live. And this is uh, the problem w uh, we faced uh, in Shanghai, too. And this was also the hindrance to the project. Renovation changes people and their minds. It is very difficult for them to preserve the terms of life they have, uh, their status quo. On the other hand, people who come to, Mos to Moscow, to Shanghai from other cities, they get used to new terms very quickly. So we need to combine these two things. So people need to choose to have a choice whether to stay where they used to live or to move somewhere. We hope that the result of uh, Mayor Sabyanin and his team's work 
will help to fulfill this target and the life of Moscow will change positively. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so as for the private developers, it depends on how they might be involved. And the question at issue is how speed of uh, territory development uh, uh, can be combined. So for today, as Sergei Ivanovich said, so, so this is the core of the technical requirements uh, for the developer to build social infrastructure at the same time. And the second recommendation would be to give people chance to leave uh, this area for another neighborhood. But uh, during the time when innovation was discussed, people were afraid that they would be moved to other other neighborhoods in Moscow. And so that was one of the psychological factors for stabilizing the situation was that people were promised that uh, they will live close to the place where they used to live. So this uh, wave, uh, this relocation in wave will guarantee people that no one uh, will uh, move and touch them. Now I would like uh, Lady Daniela Alamir to tell about her experience because you are known as a person who created Aspern Quarter and with your experience what uh, recommendation could you g give to Moscow renovators? Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, obviously, it was not me alone who created Aspen. We are talking about um, a city district for more than 20,000 people, um, which I believe maybe for the size of Moscow, it's, it's small, but for Vienna, it is quite a huge impact. Um, let me tell you before I start uh, giving you a few ideas how the approach of the development in Aspen was, was done or applied, that uh, the situation in Vienna is quite different from Moscow. Or right, let's say there is, I think we have one thing in common. Vienna is an extremely fast growing city. Um, Vienna is probably the second fastest city, uh, growing city in, in the whole Europe. So we do expect uh, another 250,000 people within until 2025. Now you can see that uh, Seestadt Aspen, the new city district that is just about to, to get developed, will host only 20,000 people. That's nothing, to be honest. We actually need 10 of this Seestadt Aspen to kind of deal with the growth of the city. But I do believe maybe in a few years um, we're going to invite you to Vienna and you will tell us more about your experience with the renovation because this is something that we are going to face for sure. We are not there yet, but of course we do have quite a lot of social houses also in Vienna built in the 60s, built in the, in, the, in the 70s, that are now getting to a very shabby, no, not very, but they will get there eventually to a shabby condition. And then I think we do need to get some expertise on, on renovation because this is something that we definitely do not have yet because there was no need for that. So. Um, now let me talk a little bit about the Seestadt Aspen, um, which is a city inside the city, or actually a city outside of the city of Vienna. Um, this was pretty much, this district was pretty much um, developed by scratch. So it's not a renovation program, it's really creating a new piece of, of Vienna. And I know that well, yeah, I think Russians really love Vienna because there's a lot of you in Vienna, uh, tourists and, and more and more coming to live there, and they know one side of Vienna, it's the Stephansdom and it's the Viennese Philharmonics and stuff like this. So I show you a few, a few uh, 
pictures now of Vienna, which you probably don't know. So I'm going to take you on to a little trip outside of Vienna um, and to Seestadt Aspern, as I've said. And there's always one question that comes to my head that I don't think we really do have an answer to that, or that at least it's extremely complex. And I don't think we should make a difference between renovation programs or projects and building new city districts from scratch. It's the question about urbanity. And at the end, it's a question about the quality of life. So the question I, I was thinking about was uh, what kind of urban models and urban planning implementation or even financing strategies can help find answers to embrace urban quality in a newly built city district. I am totally sure about that creating a new city district means enormous challenges and that really needs a highly differentiated uh, approach. And I believe we still do not have all the answers for that. But uh, yeah, let's think about it. So I've told you a little bit about the Seestadt Aspen. It's a new center, 240 hectares for 20,000 people there. And maybe if we do it in the right way, we'll see 20,000 workplaces. We do have a public transportation there. Um, it's connected with the underground. This was, I, I thought, a genius strategic move by the city to put the public transportation system there first. So, but people wouldn't understand that in the beginning because you would go into this, you would hop on the metro, go from the really city center outside in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I believe strategically this was extremely important because being connected or linked with the public transport system is very important to get people moving there. And you know Viennese, we are one of the, well, I'd, not being arrogant at all, but we, we've been just elected again the city with the highest quality of transportation system, so we know how to do that. And then uh, what, what this uh, district, city district, was about to follow was the idea of a compact mixed city. Uh, just a European city. And we know, we've just heard it in the other panel by Vinnie Maas that thinks about it a lot, rebuilding European city with a European sense and idea of, of urbanity is extremely difficult. This is how the Seestadt Aspen looks nowadays. Um, it used to be actually um, an, an area of a, of a former airport with a lake in the middle. You might think, why do you need a lake? Uh, not, I mean, yes, it is for rec recreational um, ideas or, or function as well, but the lake was there actually, the lake was put there because you want to give this uh, new city district like an image, a strong identity. So that's also where the Seestadt, the name, comes from. So I would say that one third of the district is already built by now. And now I would like to highlight a few principles of a development, um, and not only development, but also principle of, of concepting the whole, the whole city district. Um, that despite from the actual planning, because planning is one thing, I believe there is, we know how to do this, there's really good architects and urban planners, and I'm not so much want to talk about the quality of the houses, because this is standard, especially social housing in Vienna, we have an extremely high standard, um, you will probably all be surprised. I want to talk about other things, and these are more strategic principles, principles of financing, principles of management structures, governance, and so on. So, first of all, Seestadt Aspen is much more than only housing. It is not only for dwelling. The aims uh, that were joined with, uh, with creating this new city district was actually to establish or to embrace quite a big variety of, of mix of, 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 of uses. Um, so the question that the planners and the developers were facing was actually how are we going to be able to, to um, 
to embrace the highest possible variability of uses and the maximum flexibility, which I believe flexibility is a key word in planning um, when we are talking about embracing urbanity. And another aim, the activation of ground floor zones for uses outside of building infrastructure. In Seestadt Aspen, there was a big, the big, big, big focus was put on activating the ground floors because the ground floors are the, 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 is the level of a building that communicates with the outside, that activates, that brings really vibrancy and that brings the life to an to an urban to an urban district. And this is not easy at all, especially. Um, especially thinking about the, the, the financial situation. The pressure that the developers have, it's not easy to activate these ground floor zones. So the requirements that were, were um, bound to this was uh, the new usage, to, to implement new usage models and activation concept. And I do believe that the Seestadt Aspen Development Agency and experts, of course, they were really able to to implement very innovative and creative ideas on that. Another requirement was the coexistence of the internal and the external space. We have heard that today as well. So it's always about communicating between inside and outside. And the coexistence between civil society responsibility and the governmental control. And I found it very, very important or interesting that today in the first, the, uh, the first talk we have heard, I heard three times the word standard. I do believe and I'm totally convinced standard is an extremely important principle. But I believe, I also think, and this is why the Seestadt Aspen is a very innovative or interesting, interesting project, they showed or it, it was showed that sometimes you just need to leave space, but controlled, you know, the controlled void. Um, how can you facilitate or embrace flexibility for new things to pop up, for new uses, for the new coexistence between uses, between part between users, between players. So I think and this is very, very, very tricky and very, very um, difficult. So the variation of space is maybe the highest good that Seestadt Aspen can offer. It is about the differentiated terms and condition of views and areas of focus. So we're not talking only about houses, as I've said. We are talking about educational sites, about commerce, commercial uh, uses and service, and about research, development, and housing. And when I'm talking about housing, there are so many different forms of housing. Of course, not only not only permanent housing, but temporary housing, housing for students, housing for all different kind of people. Another, another key word or a key principle is the centralized management of ground floor zones to develop and embrace a well-functioning local supply infrastructure. Now think about a city that is actually managed or the public space, uh, the commercial space of a, of a city that is managed like a um, commercial center. I, I find that a very, very interesting thought because like this it is really a way that you can manage it, um, you, you can actually manage it in, 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 a, in, a, in a strategic way. So this is how the the situation looks like with the with the floor with the floor zones. These are the uses that you find in the floor zones. There is a bookshop that got established and a cafeteria cafeteria that got that that, that moved in. Um, you can't simply tell the people, okay, open your bookshop 20 kilometers out of the city center. Nobody would do that because. It's, it's, it's not really interesting, so they came up with, with, rather, with rather innovative financing models, how to reduce the, the rent, so to attract new tenants, and, and then... 
Another key point was the public space. The public space was probably uh, maybe even the most important, important point um, for the Seestadt Aspen. It got uh, developed right in the beginning, even before there was any house there. So the new, they knew that the public space is, is actually the, the joint, is the, the thing that holds everything together. And the public space is at least as important as the private space inside. Okay, I have to speed up. I heard it twice. So just a few. Somebody wants to push us away from here. Yeah, already they want me a, a, okay, a couple of times. Okay, don't worry, I have two more points. Another, another aspect, the cooperative construction group, which I believe it, 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 this is something that is very Austrian or let, bound to the, to the German building and developing um, culture. How to bring in more variety in housing was actually to give lots to people, to a loose group of people involved in a very active collaboration that builds a building for housing and for working there. So this is totally different from, from the regular development uh, logics. And then the last point, which I believe what believe uh, makes, or the, the pre-last point, what makes uh, Aspen very, very um, innovative in a way is the smart mobility. It's the way um, the, the parking system works, the way the, the transportation bikes are offered, the way the public space connects all this different kind of transportation. And as well the neighborhood management, which is going to be my last point. It's not only about planning and not only about con making concepts and, and standards and all this kind of thing. You also need a very good management structure that helps people move in, that accompanies them, that supports a lively and vivid neighborhood, that gives information and that supports the active participation to make this new district the district of the people, not for the people, so to make it them, their own and to help uh, in the process of the identification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so uh, very much. It was really exciting and interesting, like a neurosurgery. So the same uh, approach to the same problems. And I would like uh, Tatiana Polidi, who is the executive director of the Urban Economy, to tell us uh, about uh, opportunities and risks for Muscovites for projects of that scale. Uh, thank you. I will try to speed up. So my presentation is called Economics uh, of redevelopment or redevelopment of economy. Any redevelopment on an urban scale can influence whatever parameters a city economy has, from the most local one to macroeconomic. On the level of uh, revenues and the state of city budget, everything is influenced under the urban planners, like uh, renovation comparable to renovation program in Moscow. And of course, international experience offers a number of solutions, like uh, separate uh, private programs and major uh, urban and national programs. So like uh, urban renewal program in the States, uh, 1949, uh, 1979, and the Renaissance uh, Economy Program in Japan. I wanted to illustrate uh, that there is just one common conclusion, that we have two countries uh, among the leading economies of the world, and in both cases, programs uh, faced some economic limitations and restrictions they had to resolve. For instance, urban renewal program in the States is still a point for discussion in terms of its uh, final economic and social consequences. And a well-known outcome of the program became uh, the death and life of great American cities by Jane Jacobs, uh, so which is criticized. Uh, but in 2010, 
A research was carried out which proved that the main achievements of the program were rather positive than negative. And in Japan, the program was stopped for 10 years due to macroeconomic crisis uh, related to deflation. Uh, which also created some unexpected situations for the program. So international experience shows us that redevelopment on urban and on nationwide uh, level can have both, both positive and negative effects for economy. And using all the tools of the economic science we have for forecasting, we can take all these effects into the account like all the influence of uh, program on economy and how economic conditions can influence the uh, program itself. So requirements to economically feasible projects could be four basic. So the growth of uh, capitalization of the territory, so the cost of land and uh, real estate, which is a basic requirement. So if we don't end uh, with the growth uh, in capitalization, so you can put the project away. Next, improvement of not just physical parameters of residential areas, but also improving exits of all um, citizens, the growth of the market of uh, products and services on the territory, uh, creating the services itself. And the fourth item is uh, increasing the net revenues of the city budget. Uh, because no transformation should uh, uh, bring around some problems to the budget. So we've uh, conducted a program of renovation on an experiment territory. And this is the first assessment, the first figures. Very seldomly they assess uh, renovation, but agglomeration now is 60% of GDP uh, or 55 billion rubles. So the housing activities in the city, in uh, the agglomeration, uh, is now a big fund and a big share of people's uh, funds. And it's most important that the housing uh, doesn't lose uh, its cost. And this is what we are trying to consider in our project. We also try to consider uh, international experience concerning economic uh, effects. So let me add a few words how using this tools. We try to manage uh, uh, different parameters of the program. And number one is uh, capitalization enhance. Well, the territory uh, be becomes more intensively inhabited, and this also enhances uh, the potential for an all land area. So the costs for uh, housing should be stable. So for that, uh, the capitalization increase uh, can be only due to uh, increase of housing. And the, you can see uh, on the left hand uh, how it become inefficient, and uh, on the right hand how it can be efficient, where everything is in harmony. Capitalization increase uh, for renovation is a good fact. If it's negative, then uh, we don't need to go on renovation. It should also improve uh, the wealthiness of uh, all the participants, uh, the businessmen uh, and the citizens, uh, those who move and those who do not move. Uh, Vernadsky Prospect is a very good example where all the stakeholders win. Housing condition improvement. What is meant here? For that, we need to realize what uh, the status 
equal as 19 square meters per capita uh, is, uh, well, the amount of housing uh, in Moscow. Uh, but uh, housing in households are different things and two different things. Uh, for Moscow, comparing to Moscow area, the housing deficiency is about 15 percent. So we need to eliminate those disbalances, making the approach more balanced. So we do not only want to give housing to those who move, but also to improve the balance and to balance the housing in the city. Uh, services and goods. For them, we need infrastructure. First and foremost, highways and roads. Uh, well, there also should be a balance uh, between housing and commercial facilities. All this is clear, uh, and you all know that. But we need to have people who work there uh, for the services, so we need to have shop assistants. We need to have uh, barbers for barber shop, and this is uh, all important. What can we do? We can calculate uh, how the uh, how the costs go down, how the benefits go up on this very territory. Uh, Prospect Vernadsky is a very good example. Again. So small business turn of, of uh, goes to billion high after the renovation. One more issue is Moscow city budget. It's significant uh, to make uh, territories autonomous. And if further, uh, there will be new blocks of flats, they need not to diminish those benefits and uh, uh, and to at least to be less than funds and allocations even in the United States of America and uh, uh, that was on the previous slide I will not show it to you so even the United States of America when the uh, develop new territories, uh, very often uh, costs are more than benefits, and they, uh, they have to include them into the previous territories for balance, and, the, and that is difficult. Thank you very much. That is all I wanted to share with you. Thank you for that presentation. Now I know why uh, houses in Astoshenko Street is uh, uh, more uh, expensive than that on uh, Vernadsky pro Prospect. I'm kidding, certainly. Astoshenko is a historical area of Moscow, very expensive historically. But still, it's good when some conclusions are provocative. So, dear experts, sorry uh, for uh, not keeping up with the time. And I would like to thank all the participants of the discussion. Each of them, each of you, has shared their experience from different angle. From, and so we have this kind of eight angle perspective. And thus, I would like uh, to wish all of you good luck uh, and to thank you once again for very interesting information. Thank you very much for being such a good moderator of our session. Thank you very much.